but I've worried from the start that the inability to admit any criticism of Benjamin Netanyahu's regime, not of Israel it, uh, per se, but of, but of Benjamin Netanyahu's regime, I suppose you, you can conflate the two, can't you? They've become, in a sense, the same thing in recent years, would embolden him to take ever more heinous liberties. Uh, and you can track it through the conversations that we've had on this program. The way in which at, at the very beginning, we talked about the necessity of Israel responding in incredibly robust fashion, the inevitability of the murder of hundreds of civilians being met with a equal and opposite force. I, I, innocent Palestinians were going to die as a consequence of the terrorist attack upon innocent Israelis. Quite quickly after that, we started to... Uh, explore the word proportionate, explore the word, word justified. I don't know when for you the word proportionate left the building, whether it was when the death toll in Gaza reached 10,000 perhaps or, or, or 20,000, 30,000 or 40,000 and the final figure of course guaranteed to be incredibly higher than that, almost unbearably higher than that. People being bombed in, in schools, people being bombed in shelters to which they have been moved in order to ostensibly stay safe. And throughout all of it, the accusation was that this was either justified or I think we can probably most agree now, quite laughably, the claim that great care was being taken to avoid civilian death propaganda from Benjamin Netanyahu's office, even making its way via uh, a, a discredited journalist into the oldest Jewish newspaper in the world, into the Jewish Chronicle in this country, where enormous questions remain to be answered by uh, people who have very much created an atmosphere in which people like me were once even uh, not quite frightened, but certainly would think twice about speaking our mind for fear of being labelled all sorts of uh, hideous epithets. But months after October the 7th, it became pretty clear. People started to say it out loud. People started to say out loud things like, I mean, members of uh, Netanyahu's cabinet, including people who have um, had terrorist convictions themselves in the cabinet, started saying out loud that, that the notion that there were no such thing as innocent people in Gaza. But the mantra throughout was that the carnage was necessary in order to rescue the hostages. And, and in this country, I think we're probably, despite the best efforts of our friend in Jerusalem, Noga Tarnopolsky, we're probably not clear on just how little patience the families of the surviving hostages have with that idea or with that rhetoric. They largely feel enormously betrayed by Netanyahu and have done for some time. So that's Gaza. The idea that the carnage there was somehow designed to get the hostages released, I think, disappeared over the horizon um, some time ago. And now they turn their attempt, their attentions to Lebanon, which is uh, which is an independent sovereign country, and to Hezbollah as opposed to Hamas. Um, Hezbollah responsible, sponsored by Iran and responsible for launching rockets into Israel um, uh, 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 sporadically and, and repeatedly. But the escalation that we see now between Israel and a powerful militant group, to me, becomes the most frightening and the most significant example yet of this basic observation. It's an observation that has been in place since... Well, probably the, the end of October of last year, certainly early November, is that there is nothing Netanyahu will not do in order to protect himself, in order to shore up his position, regardless of what is best for Israel. And, and one of the hardest things that objective commentators have, have had to do is watch Benjamin Netanyahu sacrifice Israel's international reputation and hemorrhage what you could call objective or humanitarian support for Israel, which was arguably the highest it will ever be in the immediate aftermath of October the 7th. To watch Benjamin Netanyahu hemorrhage that, to, to, to throw in many senses that the liberal Jewish cause under a bus to denigrate the notion of a two-state solution, which is regarded by everybody honest, 
as the only way out of this historic mess. And the idea that there was nothing he wouldn't do, there was no depth to which he would not plumb in pursuit of self-preservation, is now, I would argue, impossible to resist. Because against all advice, despite the best efforts of the United States and the United Nations to avoid an escalation, the uh, Israeli administration has undertaken a program of... Well, I, I, I wonder whether you think the word indiscriminate has a place here. Whether or not you think the word indiscriminate has a place here. Because if, if I put an explosive in your pocket and have absolutely no idea where you will be when it detonates. Is that an indiscriminate attack upon people? But where are you right now? Have a look around. If you're on your own in the car and you think this doesn't apply to you, what happens if the explosion renders you incapable of driving the car and you plow it into that queue of people at a bus stop over there? Just, just, just think about what would happen right now if a significant explosive charge were to be unexpe unexpectedly detonated in your hand or in your pocket, how close are you standing to, to, to people near you? Do you see? It seems to me to be uh, uh, an event that opens the door to accusations of, of everything up to and including potential war crimes. Because what do you think of? Or what, 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 what parallel do you draw? With, with previous prescribed groups, if MI5 had managed to secrete tiny amounts of explosives into the pockets of everybody uh, believed to be a member of the IRA, if, if, and, and they then blew up while IRA members were going about their lawful business as opposed to their unlawful business. They blew up on the school run. They blew up in the queue for... Uh, uh, for lunch, they, they, they blew up in a bus queue, they blew up in a market, they blew up in a hospital, they blew up in a doctor's waiting room. It seems to me they'd be, you could be at a petrol station, says David. Uh, unlikely in Gaza, given that most of it has been raised to the ground, but perfectly plausible and possible in Lebanon. And that makes me wonder what Benjamin Netanyahu wants. And I'm quite frightened of that question. Because, as I say, those of us who refuse to bend to the violent demands that we feel sadder about a Palestinian death than we do about an Israeli death, or that we feel sadder about an Israeli death than we do about a Palestinian death, those of us who insist upon humanitarianism, who insist upon our objectivity, look upon Benjamin Netanyahu now. Unless your blinkers are strapped so tightly to your head, you must fear what it is that he wants. This is uh, a, a, an indiscriminate, and I would say, I'll add arguably, in order to be, um, uh, what's the word I want, even-handed, an arguably indiscriminate attack on an entirely new front. How does this rescue hostages? How does this help hostages come home? Answer, it doesn't. So the idea that Israeli violence, that Israeli attacks, Israeli assaults are justified by the necessity of bringing the hostages home has just disappeared over the horizon like all of the other Israeli excuses and Israeli explanations for the continuing carnage in Gaza. No, no one can argue that. You can talk about the rockets, of course you can, and, and we must. They, of course, fly in, in, in both directions. But you want to look at death tolls, you want to look at effectiveness of weapons, and you are, to coin an unfortunate phrase, you, you, you are, I'm afraid, looking at a, a, a conflict of David and Goliath proportions. Except on, on this occasion, David, um, well, uh, you can work the rest out yourself. So, what does he want? You, you follow these matters. Quite possibly you follow them more closely than I do. Uh, it, it's important to get the question right. What, what does he want? This order will have come from the same place that uh, all of the other orders have come from. The retreat from the claim that it was proportionate is, is now complete. The retreat from the claim that all attacks were designed to free hostages has now disappeared over the horizon, that, that the claim that Israel went to enormous lengths to protect civilian life has been rendered, if it wasn't already, completely ridiculous. 
What does Benjamin Netanyahu want? How can anybody argue now? As the prospect of World War Three arguably teeters closer to plausibility than at any time since the Bay of Pigs, how can anybody really construct an argument against the idea that all Benjamin Netanyahu wants, and the only reason that he's doing this, is to postpone his own judgment, to postpone forever longer the moment of accountability. And I guess in his heart of hearts, in his dreams, he hopes that he can postpone it forever. It is 40 minutes after 10. Janet says, the war is no longer about rescuing hostages. If they had been released, this would have been over. Why don't you say that? Um, because Janet, and again, I appreciate, it's sometimes difficult to get a proper handle on this from the UK end of the media circus. Netanyahu made it clear some time ago that the release of the hostages would not signify an end of attacks in Gaza. And, and you have to explain to me how releasing hostages in Gaza would have prevented Netanyahu from launching these arguably indiscriminate attacks on a completely different territory against a completely different enemy. And please, don't just reach immediately for the cliché or the slogan. Just try to answer that question. If this is still about hostages that he said um, the release of would not signal an end in hostilities, then why is he now attacking a completely different enemy in a completely different region who, at this point in history, haven't taken any hostages whatsoever? So what do you think, what do you think he wants? 0345 6060 973. What do you think he wants?